Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Phil Yanov. There you go. It's how we get this thing started. Hello, nice people. Welcome to Conversations with Modern Stoicism. I am delighted to have you here. I'm as my eyes, when my eyes roll around, by the way, it's because this is me looking at you in the camera, trying to make you feel warm and welcome. And that's what we want to have happen. This is me going, okay, is everybody here? Is it all going right through the slides? If you ever saw a picture of what this looks like, there's seven screens across the front of me trying to make sure that we're doing a good job for you. So uh, thank you for being here. It can be a little bit of, you know, let me be a nerd occasionally just to make sure that everything is going right. How about we, um, one of the things we want to do is make sure that your fingers work. And the way we do that is we get you to type things into the chat periodically. So let's start with that. How about telling us, I know if you, you already know your way around, I love having repeat offenders here, but tell us where in the world you are. Just stick that down inside the chat. Let's see some of those spin by. Um, so yeah, it's where we go. Italy, Manchester, Switzerland, Uruguay, the UK, Mexico. Super fun. Look at this. Just kind of build up Canada, Bavaria, Baltimore, Maryland. You know, as a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, I still welcome you here. Or even Baltimore people are welcome here. Glad to have you. Uh Wilmington, North Carolina, Calgary, North Carolina. I won't get to say all of these, by the way. It's not because I don't love you. It's just that there's so many of them going by. But thank you for being here. I just, I love the fact that I think we're, I think this is the eighth one now, right? So we're on the eighth one of these and we just have people from all over the world. And I apologize to those of you who might be in Australia, New Zealand. I know this is a terrible time of day to kind of be pulling that off. And uh, I know sometimes those folks kind of watch the tape afterwards. I don't know how to fix that yet. I wish I had a time machine, but here we are. Let me tell you what we're going to do. Um, so you are at a thing called Conversations with Modern Stoicism. And we're going to start here with these introductions that we're doing right now. Then we've got the wonderful Nancy Sherman is here, and she's going to give us a presentation. We'll do a little bit of group Q&A, and then we're going to lead you into breakout rooms. Um, we'll do that. We'll do the breakout rooms and we'll come and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the breakout rooms just a little bit. And then poof, we'll put you into another breakout room, new people this time. And then we'll um when we get into that, it'll be there'll be a follow-up discussion. We'll again we do that all one more time. Then there's QA at the end, and then we'll we'll talk to you about next steps. I'm gonna bring Nancy Sherman up here, add her to the spotlight so that you can see her. Maybe get her unmuted. <clears throat> How's that? There we go. You're mm -hmm. you're doing fantastic. Nancy, what have you been? doing over the holiday let's think you really want to know partly over the holiday i have been doing an ancient philosophy search in my in my university department um but i've also been thinking a lot about aristotle and which i and i will share that with you today um and uh i didn't get a chance to see my kids which is unfortunate um but um i read a lot and, yeah. and that's probably my greatest fun <laughs> i sure. read books about philosophy philosophy yeah. in great britain uh women philosophers in great britain during world war ii who found who turned returned us to the ancients especially aristotle so um i was blown away by that and even blown away by the fact that i had met uh, several of those individuals when I studied in in um, in Scotland and in in England, so that was exciting. Yeah, I really. Did, I mean, listen, that's my kind of exciting, right? I know I posted something <laughs> earlier, and I said, "Well, it was like January fourth, and I said, so far I've finished these four books, and they were all philosophy books." And so I was like, right. "That just sounds like a job." I said, "It wasn't. I did it because I liked it. I had a great time." It was right. super fun. That's good for you. Um, so among those, who stands out for you? The women philosophers post-World War II. Is that what you said? Post-World yeah, War II. Yeah, yeah, or during. Actually, the women yeah. philosophers in World War II, when the, when the men went to war or worked in the British intelligence, cracking code, um, they were allowed into the pearly, not pearly gates, but allowed into the gates of Oxford and into the libraries. Thank you, Virginia Woolf. And yes. they kind of discovered that some of that ordinary language philosophy, philosophy, which was 
popular at the time and analyzing sentences and logic was not really understanding how to live well and some of the evil they were seeing in the world um, mm. in World War II. And they returned to Aristotle and they wrote about Aristotle. And so some of them are novelists. One is Iris Murdoch, a very famous British novelist. Sure. Um, and so I was blown away, especially since I had studied with some of them and, and, and my teachers were their students. So it was like, ooh, I'm in a, I'm right. in a lineage. <laughs> you are definitely in a lineage. And uh, <laughs> thank you for being here with us today. Can I introduce yes. you and let you have the stage? Yes, uh, I certainly can. can. And I Let's wanted to it. say yes to Hope May. And those are the two books I just read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so thank you. Wonderful. All right. So let me uh, let me do this, get your introduction here. And I apologize. I always have to read these because there's so much goodness here. I can't memorize it all. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Nancy Sherman is a leading expert on stoicism and its relevance to modern life. As distinguished university professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, she has published groundbreaking scholarship on stoic philosophy and ethics. Her latest book, Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience, draws out the stoic teachings most useful for contemporary readers. Sherman has also authored Stoic Warriors, The Ancient Philosophy Behind the Military Mind, demonstrating how Stoic principles have shaped military ethics and culture. In addition to her academic work, she speaks widely on applying Stoicism to building resilience to overcome trauma. She advises the military on addressing moral injury through Stoic practices. With over 60 articles and books, Sherman is taught as a sought-after voice, making Stoicism accessible and relevant to the challenges we face today. Her insightful work continues to illuminate the value of this ancient philosophy that I hope we all love, and that is exactly why I've got her here speaking to us today. Thank you, Nancy, and a round of applause, however you do it, on the screen, do the thing. Oh, wait, oh and I've got this right here. What a wizard. It's all you. Okay. It's all you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Phil, for uh, all of that. And thank you all for being here. It is morning on the East Coast of the United States, but as Phil said, uh, ungodly hours elsewhere. So um, I want to talk about soul and having soul like the ancients. But today I want to shake things up a little bit, um, even though this is modern stoicism for him. And I want to uh, return to a love that I've had longer than my husband. In fact, um, some of those women philosophers I was talking about um, found this love too. And that is Aristotle, um, a Valentine's Day gift my husband gave me, actually strange one, but that is a statue he gave me. Um, so I've, you know, I've written several books on stoicism. But my first book uh, was this one um, called The Fabric of Character, um, based somewhat on my dissertation. And I, I want to return now to Aristotle. Um, so why Aristotle? And why Aristotle uh, as a path to cultivating a good soul? It's in part because Stoicism is a reaction to Aristotle implicitly or explicitly. So if we just remember the Stoics hold that we can find resilience and grit in a way that protects us against loss and tragedy, or at least uh, helps us find equanimity in those moments. And they hold that we can strengthen our will, um, our power of choice uh, and our virtue so we can kind of arm ourselves somewhat against the slings and arrows of fortune. And we don't, have to retreat to an inner citadel, but we know the real strength is inside. And as Epictetus says, we're enslaved not by masters who rule us from the outside, but masters who would rule us from within. And it's those demons we have to conquer. Acquisitiveness, um, hunger for fame, hunger for honor, um, hunger for money. So and Marcus Aurelius says, you know, we're all connected like limbs to a, a torso. And if you've seen limbs scattered on a battlefield, he says, that's that's what we're like if we 
pull ourselves apart from this cosmic harmony. But the cosmic harmony is cosmic. It's large. It's a whole universe, the whole of humanity. Um, and, and in many ways, what's outside and not our virtue are they give this horrible term really without a difference does not make a difference. They are indifference TS. Um, and you might select and prefer friendships, but they're not part of the inner core of your flourishing. Now in all this, the Stoics are responding to Aristotle. He is their arguing partner, at least in ethics. And it's because he is, he is the titan of the ancient world. There's just no doubt about it. He's the famed student of Plato and for a while the tutor of, um, of a notorious um, young leader, uh, Alexander the Great. Um, and Aristotle was a polymath in science and meteorology and botany. Um, in, um, he was an early zoologist of sleep, streams, and ethics, almost every field of knowledge. So why were the Stoics staking out their position against him? It's because he insists, this is Aristotle now, that the, um, that the vulnerability of life is inescapable. We are social creatures whose attachments expose us to loss. We're emotional creatures who can surge with joy and, and one moment anguish the next. And he's just radically honest about the human uh, condition and the challenges that come from within and without. And he understands that goodness is fragile, and that the but that the key ingredient to building a truly resilient life is social connection. And he says, I have to say with with some irony, our self sufficiency is relational. Our complete goodness is incomplete, or our goodness is incomplete and only becomes complete with other people. So what is what does it take to nourish a good soul on Aristotle's view? Our souls in, this, in the ancient tradition are our psyches. Um, psyche is just the Greek word for soul, um, Latin anima. But Aristotle's not talking about an immortal soul or a mind, a psyche detached from a body. Soul is the life force of a body. It's what animates it and makes it alive. Um, and it's what animates it, not just in bodies, but in the social and political worlds we live. So Aristotle, like Plato and Socrates before him, holds that the best part of our souls is our reason, um, our logos. But reason isn't divorced from emotions. It's, it infuses emotions, it directs them, it cultivates them so that we can express them in action and thoughts that rise above brute impulse or blind fury. And so the point is never to suppress emotions, but to educate them, or in Aristotle's words, habituate them. N not in, you know, not like learning how to tie your shoes, um, but in a way in which they are really cultivated. So that's, if you like, the Aristotelian project of nurturing a sensitive but rational soul so we can flourish in the face of challenges, some tragic and some not so tragic. Aristotle, after all, wrote the, he wrote a lot on tragedy, the poetics about um, terror and pity we feel for actors on stage who, who have terrible, terrible fates or make mistakes. And he's talking about us. That's we are in the audience. He's talking about having pity and fear um, as we face the challenges of life. So now resilience, and really Aristotle's word is constancy, mani mas kai babaya, stable and constant. Um, that comes from <coughs> excuse me, from within, but also from without. We depend upon friends for community. Here we are together, central to our happiness. And the Stoics didn't think they were in the inside of our flourishing or thriving. That's why they call them indifference, preferred um, in many circumstances to be selected, um, but they don't make or break your happiness. They're just not integral to happiness. They're supporting conditions, not integral. 
And so Aristotle couldn't have disagreed more. And the Stoics took their took, staked a position precisely against that. Aristotle says social connections are real goods, genuine goods, even if we can't control them in a way we can control our virtues or excellences of character. They're not peripheral, they're not optional, they're essential components of flourishing. And they are just part of, you might say, the fabric of character and flourishing. So let's focus on that social fabric right now for a little while. <clears throat> Aristotle opens the Nicomachean and he says, it's, it's absurd to make the very happy person a solitary for no one would choose to have all other goods and yet be alone since a human being is, this is a famous line, social and political by nature, and the nature is to live with others. So in that regard, Aristotle, and this was shocking to that uh, community of 20th century philosophers at Oxford and Cambridge, two books were devoted to friendship, two of 10. Many in those early days systematically ignored those books because they didn't know what to do with them. That didn't sound like morality. That sounded like preferential treatment, partiality, not morality, which is supposed to be impartial. Um, but Aristotle said there, it isn't, it, it isn't outside, it's central. And it's more time in, the, in his ethics than he devoted to anything else. So what are all the ways we can weave friends into the fabric of a social fabric. He says some we do business with, they're useful. He uses the word utility, um, but he means they come together for common purpose. And even being fellow citizens is that kind of fellowship. Um, that's something we should think about, uh, a fellowship he's really thinking about, common cause. Others come together because of pleasure, trivial or serious. He says, drinking buddies, playing dice together, but you can do philosophy. In my case, dance, dancing partners. Um, uh, you name your favorite recreational or pleasure activity. Um, and then he says, some friendships aren't chosen, but are family ties. You just, you have them. He says, they must suffice, that's his words. Whether you have affinities or not. But the best friends, he says, are character friends, friends of excellent character. And they're friends you choose to spend your time with, spend your days with, because you're committed to understanding what it takes to live good lives. And he says a friend is another self, a mirror, uh, not for amped up navel gazing, he says, but, na but for self-knowledge. We see ourselves better, he says, through other persons who have a little bit more objective perspective. Uh, and especially the discerning and trusted eye of a good friend who's empathetic. He emphasizes singleness of mind, feel the same pain, feel the same joy, as if you could, he says, um, but honest. And he says, a good friend, uh, this is now in the rhetoric, tells us of our weak points in a way, he says, we do not feel literally, quote, ashamed of our shortcomings. So they don't shame us. Now, it's not just good friends Aristotle has in mind but friends who are good. So he worries about when to give up friends whose values have drifted too far from your own or who once were good, but no longer are. And he says, quote, not able to be reformed no matter how hard you try. And he says, quote, there's nothing strange. She counsels about breaking off those friendships, however painful the ruptures. So I think these are concerns we all have as we struggle. I do at least, you know, with friendships across changes in our lives, changes in our world that expose sharp political um, and partisan divides um, and differing views on, um, on, on hot issues. Um, and they create chasms in friendships and we have to decide, do we pull the plug or not? Now, he says, friends spend time together. That's his phrase. It's a repeated phrase. It's like a trope, spend time together, days together. Uh, not as, it's not really funny, not as cattle grazing the same pasture, he says, but sharing in discourse and thought. So friends need the space to argue. And if there isn't that space, it has to be created. Now, when I teach Aristotle to my students in class, 
they really feel seen when Aristotle says, too many friends make friendship watery. That's a comment from his politics. That's literally watery. It's the word for watery. So all of a sudden, they start wondering about virtual friendships and fan bases and if they, what Aristotle might have thought about them. Now, um, that phrase, spending days together, I always thought spending time together, he's got to think about households. He writes about households, families, but families really weren't where the action was in his world. Um, women had very, women weren't, uh, had, had reason that was out of control, without control. Children had reason that was undeveloped. So he's thinking about friends that he would meet in the Athenian marketplace, in his, in the Lyceum. Um, and so, you know, it's not domestic or romantic partners. This isn't Plato's symposium, eros, or erotic partners. Aristotle's phrase is philia, like Philadelphia's um, brotherly fellowship, the notion of fellowship. And they're, significant others don't have to be domestic partners. There are other significant others in Aristotle's world. Mm -hmm. He just has in mind soulmates. And so soulmates who care about having a good soul not passively as an aspiration, but as an active aspiration. If there's any hallmark in Aristotle's philosophy is that it's a, a good life is an active life. It requires putting character into action. Rubber's got to meet the road. And so friends on Aristotle re, are, uh, Aristotle's view are what makes an active life of cultivating and exercising virtue possible. And I'll just, I'll come to the end very soon, but that doesn't mean uh, that enlarged sense of self comes at a cost. And it's just that cost that really worries the Stoics. Cultivating a friendship isn't like cultivating a character. The investment is in the relationship. And if there's loss or death, the relationship doesn't survive, no matter how alive your, your memories stay. Um, and so if, if for the Stoics, there's no really good, or orthodox Stoics, good or reasonable distress. And equanimity really requires pre-rehearsing losses, and accepting that what's outside your will and good character uh, are, are um, something of, uh, that aren't essential. And so despair and grief have a hard time finding their place in a stoic thought. But Aristotle knows we grieve when we lose friends. And he says, there's tragedy. Um, and he says, we don't really toughen ourselves by practicing loss, um, but that doesn't mean we live in the moment. And he has these wonderful notions of practical wisdom that's dexterity, agility. And his phrase is, you hit the mean. You learn how to hit the mean. That doesn't mean some midpoint between excess and deficiency. It actually means, as he unpacks it, you know when you act, how to act toward the right persons in the right way at the right time in the right manner you somehow have all that skill set of agility in your uh, practical wisdom. So that requires emotional sensitivity, not just uh, uh, intellectual agility. So, and I think that sensitivity, as I said, comes out in his idea that we suffer pity and fear in real life, just as we do as an audience watching Oedipus make his horrible mistakes or Antigone have to decide between country or brother family. Um, and so I was recently reading the American Surgeon General um, and he says, we're in an epidemic of loneliness. It's all, it, it, and he has statistics about how problematic this is. Uh, the real hazard isn't smoking or drinking at this point, it's loneliness. And his prescription is spend time each day with those you love. And that's Aristotle's prescription as well. And so I think that's a very good reason to bring Aristotle back. And that's what I hope we can do as we chat today in our breakout sessions. Phil, over to you. You know, you brought this to a thing that has been on my mind a lot lately, which is ex exactly that epidemic 
of loneliness that Vivek mm-hmm. Murthy talked about. And we just read and we've done some reporting on that piece as well. I think, I mean, in case someone was ever wondering why um, friendship matters, that really put it to it. It said basically that being social isolation was about the same as I think of smoking 20 cigarettes Perfect. a day or something yes. like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is a thing we obviously want to be in the mode to fix. And uh, anyway, I wanted to say just you you hit me right there where I was already thinking this is something we need to think about a lot. So first off, to, to, from me and the audience, let's say thank you to Nancy Sherman for making the presentation. I, I think this is very important in the moment. So you can applaud down inside the chat. You can do it on your screens. You can do like this. And of course, we have the forever <laughs> applause button. We can applaud just like that. So thank you for that. Um, so is that, I, I I know, I think the ethics, how do you said it differently? I always say Nicomachean ethics, but uh, I think it's a, it's a, uh, that's a hard book, <laughs> but it, there's a lot going on inside there. But as you point out, a lot of this has to do with friendship and social connection. And there's a lot for us to learn in this moment from that, I think. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, that's one of his um, books. He actually wrote, he wrote two, in other ones, you deem me in ethics, not read right. as much. And a third, which we think is uh, spurious, written and from a different hand, but at the same time, and his student, all of these, by the way, are students that are writing really good notes. He, the, these, right. he, He's not writing a, a, a textbook. Um, it's called the Magna Moralia. And that quote about a friend is another mirror is from the Magna Moralia. But he, the ethics ends saying, we're talking about political and social communities. So it's an introduction to another work called the politics. But Aristotle was a biologist, zoologist. The lagoon in the Aegean um, was his fam- favorite and famous um uh mollusk collecting places mollusks are spiny or not so connecting to nature is also critical not just connecting to others but connecting to nature because that is the world in which we live yeah preserving no, it think, too mm-hmm. right i think that's wonderful so uh, um, so we said thank you. I'm going to hold for here just a second. I'm going to explain to folks how we're going to do the breakout rooms and what the question. Then you and I are going to talk to them about what the questions are altogether. Let me uh, explain to you, the audience, first what we're about to do. So we're going to give you a couple. Of, we're going to give you a question, and we're going to put you into breakout rooms. By the way, you don't have to worry about how you get into breakout rooms. I will handle all of that. It's random. You're, I shuffle you like a deck of cards, and we'll put you out there to answer questions. Now, what are the breakout rooms a chance to do? So this is a chance for you to listen, uh, express a little bit about what this idea means to you, what Nancy's talked about. We'll, we'll tell you what the question is in a second. A chance to talk about that to each other. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to reflect personal experience, personal opinions. What we what we are not looking for you to do is it's not a coaching session. You're not here to keep, move each other forward some way, in which way. That in what we're trying to get done is just, let's just reflect. Also, by the way, as you know, this is kind of random, right? So we're gonna, we've got 125 people, I think, 122 people in the room. We will shuffle you into, like I said, small groups. Everyone will have a chance to talk. Um, the uh, And there'll be a, a timer across the top of the screen. I guess I mentioned that because uh, you are all uh, timekeepers inside the room. So I will give you 12 minutes and it'll be random. Like I said, it's getting in there. So then you're only gonna have a couple questions for me that are left. Uh, one of which is, um, how do we decide who goes first? Easy. The longest hair goes first. What? The longest hair goes best. I needed a rule that was easy. It's just the way. Is it off the top of your head, off your beard? I don't care. Do whatever peaceable thing you can think of inside the rooms. So 12 minutes, longest hair goes first. You do what we call popcorn style. After that, popcorn style means number one picks number two, number two picks number three. And you are all Again, going to watch the time. So you'll divide it up among the, the 12 minutes among you. Okay, so here is the question. If I get this right, yep. Here is the question. And while I am working on the breakout rooms, Nancy is going to explain this a little bit and put a little focus on it because it's a lot to go on. But uh, it, she says, Aristotle warns that too many friends make friendship watery. You heard her tell us that. Um, 
Nancy, what other guidance do you want to give in here? You know, you've had, you, it was clear to me, you've given this question inside your classrooms. Right. So how much, how do we connect with people these days? What are the spaces that are really important for nourishing our souls? Um, and again, I don't mean religiously or otherwise. I just mean so that we have a rational soul, a sensitive soul, an empath empathetic soul, and so that we're not driven by the things that so worry the Stoics, for example, fame, honor, applause. Aristotle actually says, joking has to be, joking's really good. It keeps, it's a social lubricant, but when it's buffoonery or you need the audience desperately, as all about you, then it's then it does not hit the mean. So it's a that's a little bit like friendship, or collecting a fan base, you might say. So those are things that have been on my mind. My students worry about this a lot. Some just go off social media entirely because they feel it's ruining their lives or addictive, um, and that's not how friends should be uh, cultivated or treated. So that's the sort of thing I had in mind. Um, yeah. significant others, you know, um, which, what kind of significant others? That's a loaded term. Right. So, and how do we use this to our advantage when we can, right? Yeah, I exactly think. Right. Yeah. Okay. So one thing, by the way, for all of you, this is, now listen to me, for those of you who are doing something else, multitasking, whatever, <laughs> come back to me for just a second. I'm about to take our picture, or at least some of us. And what that means is I need you to look into your camera and smile because I want people to think that we're having a good time. So just humor me for just a second, right? So everybody look at the camera, three, two, one, ta-da. All right, I got it. Thank you so much for that. All right, um, so well, there's a quick four question, example of a virtual friendship. Let me field that for just a second. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not sure how many of us in here are friends, but some of us are. And I, I, let me just use the example of Nancy and I, in a way, in yeah. that we have yet to be in a room together, but we have done several projects together, small projects like this. And so I have an affinity for Nancy and I would love to meet her in life at real life. I would love to continue that conversation. And that's a way that in some ways, I start with a thing that's kind of virtual, and I will eventually lead it into the real life as our lives move along their way, right? Uh, but I think that for some folks, this might be how you might only get this far, right? You got to decide. And to Nancy's point, right, your Facebook followers are not your friends. That is not <laughs> friendship, right? I think that's one of the things that kind of comes in here. Okay. Uh, 12 minutes, roughly five people to a room. You're going to be your own timekeeper. Longest here goes first. The question is in the chat. I will see you back here in 12 plus one minutes. Three, two, one, go. Off you go. Wonderful. All right, I see lots and lots of faces back. Um, you could see, you could hear, you could talk. You had conversations in there. Yes, thumbs up or nod your head or something. Kind of give me a generally positive kind of thing on this. All right, so uh, I think we'd like to hear what some folks either said or heard in their rooms about this. Maybe if you could raise a hand, I could get a little cue up here and we could talk to a few people. And I got Dan, JB, and then Christopher in order. So we're going to start there. Dan, um, I'm going to get you to unmute. Tell us uh, tell us what you heard or what went on in your room. What do you think sure. about this virtual friendship thing? Yeah, well, we were talking about what makes a, a, a friend who, who uh, is valuable to us. It could be someone who shows us something in life we we didn't know before or introduces us to something that is meaningful. And yes, someone who's sitting across from us at a cafe in person may be more likely uh, to, to do that, but a virtual friendship on a Zoom call like this could do it as well. Uh, you might even read Nancy's book and a line from that, <laughs> you know, from page five uh, really changes your life. So uh, you, you can have friends at all these different levels that help you in meaningful stuff. Yeah. 
No, I think that's right. In fact, those are the ones that we tend to get closer to, right? We tend to, you know, you start, you may well start with that friendship of either utility or pleasure and actually move to that friendship of the heart or how you want to say it. But you to that point, because you actually are aligned and you begin to care about each other and realize you are, in fact, fellow travelers. So I love that a lot. Nancy, have you, uh, what do you think about that? I, well, hi, Stoic Dan. It's lovely to see you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I sometimes wonder, would I recognize you folks on the street? And that, you know, not that I always recognize, I recognize my students. I don't always remember their names when I bump into them on campus. That's not much of a sign of anything. But yes, I think the different mediums can work well. And I love Phil's point, too, of traveling the path from, say, colleagues friends uh, with a, with a, a, a business purpose that become um, big, uh, important friends, all different. The key is to get out of loneliness and to get out of loneliness in a way uh, that's not, uh, that's healthy. And there are different, different channels for that. Yeah. And that was kind of Aristotle's point, wasn't it? That was a good that we could mine and create for ourselves. And that it was a good that we actually needed to have that great soul. Critically, critically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, I, mm -hmm. I'm completely with you. All right. I got J.B. Bell here. Check that out, friends. I'm going to ask, uh, ask you to unmute if I press the right button. Uh, yeah, we ended up with a smaller group of four, which allowed a little more participation, which was nice. Um, yeah, I'd say the as a crew, we were in broad agreement that, you know, while online relationships may begin as utility, they can absolutely deepen into more serious uh, character friendships. Uh, whether or not one eventually connects, you know, physically or not, it's about that character aspect of things. And I think the criterion we came up with, you know, if you think you would be glad to spend a day with that person and they agree, then it really ought to count. It's unfortunate that along with rejecting the shallowness of uh, virtual friendships, sometimes we uh, maybe unintentionally denigrate real friendships that remain virtual because there's no other way that they could exist. And I think that's something we should acknowledge as valuable. Um, one of the participants had to go and make things political by talking about how these are not just individual, but political choices about infrastructure, how cities are built, how <laughs> online works. Uh, that participant was me. Uh, <laughs> and I will just point out that Facebook um, used to have features built in that would allow people to connect in person they removed them absolutely on purpose because they reduced engagement. And I, I hope that that word comes in for more stick. If we can make the distinction between friendship and engagement, that'll give us a critical tool to uh, act collectively about these things and, and not just have the, I, I, I had a bad reaction to the Surgeon General, like wagging the finger that we should spend a day with our friends like, hey, dude, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't just decisions I've been making that make that difficult. Uh, so yeah, I, I couldn't resist getting that out there. But yeah, I, it was, uh, as always, pleasant to connect with folks in the group. And one of us, in fact, uh, didn't have a working microphone and was able to participate even so by using text, which, you know, reminds me of my 1980s friendships over pure text chats of that time. You know, I just have to say that word engagement, again, has gotten toxic in a certain way Ugh. engagement you know was like well think of people who are engaged um you know committed uh but engagement mm -hmm. now means social i don't know what it means it's a it's a biz term for how many clicking yeah. you know, it, click. it means are you spending time in a way that makes me money <laughs> yeah and it, well you know, i always <laughs> say that basically <clears throat> facebook is trying to start a cockfight and then sell Buick ads against it, right? I mean, they want everyone to fight and then they want to sell ads <laughs> against it. And that's kind of what's going on. Yeah, it, so, you won't see me as one of their spokesmen. Thank you, JB. <laughs> JB, by the way, is one of the cats who's not just in our WhatsApp group, but has been a great help to me in kind of figuring out my way through the world and getting that to work. And I think that's an example of someone who I've only met virtually, but we are in ways fellow travelers. He's a voice that I trust to get me problem, get problem solved, so. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you. The feeling's mutual. <laughs> All right. I'm going to bring up Christopher Tweed. Hi. What can you hear me? Yeah. We can. Tell us, all, tell us what you heard or what you said. Okay. We we had a, we had a small group. There, there were four of us. And I mean, I think we started off 
um, it was highlighted that, you know, it's not just the quantity of, of, of friends, it's the quality of those, and that not all <laughs> not all virtual friendships are equal. Uh, and, and many of them are pre-existing mm. connections. And um, I think quite a few of us in the group had moved around. And, and I mean, we, we just saw the, the, the online community as a way of hanging on to friendships that we'd, we'd formed previously. So it wasn't about um, de novo virtual friendships so much as, as, you know, reconnecting in many cases with, with friends from many years ago. And uh, I'd be interested to hear uh, maybe Nancy or somebody else's take on what happens when you reconnect with people that you haven't seen for, in my case, 40 plus years. And and uh, you find that their values and their um, their way of looking at life has, has completely changed and is, in some cases, diametrically opposed to, to, to the path that you, you have taken. So, I mean, we, we kind of saw that the virtual thing as being positive and allowing us to continue those relationships. And we maybe didn't talk quite so much about um, virtual only um, um, friendships, but there's this landscape which is unraveling over time in, in, in online communities, which is uh, poses quite a few, a few dilemmas, I think, for, for, for those of us who go back and reconnect with people and expect them to be the same as they were. <laughs> Yeah, years, no, I, I think you are absolutely right about that, Chris. And I know Nancy's going to agree, but I'm going to tell you, this just happened to me as well. I ran into someone that I hadn't seen in 35 years or more. And let me just say, she was an old flame. And I, the first thing I looked at her and she walked up to me and she said, I don't think you'll remember me. And I was like, oh no, I remember you. But my thinking on this was, my first thought, I was looking at her, my very first thought is, I am the ship of Theseus. I have been completely replaced, and you don't know me, and I don't know you, because we're 35 years apart. Nancy, this is what happens. You talked about friends for a season. Um, th that might just be what happens, right? Yeah. So Aristotle really is worried about this. You know, you might, uh, Phil said Aristotle's hard to read. Some places he's not hard to read at all because he's he's kind of giving you the common opinions um, of not just the wise, but the many. And he says, you might really want to know what to do with friends who've changed. And, you know, Christopher, is that a Scottish accent or? Irish. Oh, it's Irish. Okay. You're, yeah, I should. Uh-huh. Um, I'll get you it on mute. You're muted. That's back fine. Again. It's, right. it's 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 actually Ulster Scots. So oh, it's Ulster. Oh, oh, oh. wow. I All thought right. okay. I lived in Scotland for four years. So um, <laughs> there. The he worries about this. You know, like if friends who not only, uh, you know, all the parts have changed between <laughs> Phil's idea of Theseus's boat, is it the same or not? Matters, matters different form. I'm not sure if the form is the same either. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> but he worries when you kind of, the, the soul got corrupted in some way, or, you know, the values are so different and you question their values. And he uses the word reform. You know, we don't want to get paternalistic about this. You don't take on other people's characters unless you live with a, that individual. But you do have the options. We do help our friends. And sometimes we help friends and they can't be helped. And you decide you kind of give up on them. So it is a hard problem. I agree entirely. It's a, we he doesn't have all the answers. He gives us a framework for thinking about it. That's right. Exactly right. An yeah. outline and we fill in the details, he says, because time is a good partner and a good discoverer. Right. I love it. All right. Listen, uh, and I, I see I've got more hands up and I'm just we don't have time to get to those and to get the next breakout done and all of that. So if we love you. Hopefully we'll come back to you in the next go around. But we're going to go to the next question here. In the, for the next breakout room. And Nancy, how about you talk about the question while I'm doing this? Uh, okay, sure. So um, 
we've covered some of this, so I, I hope that you can find some new ground or continue where you were before. Aristotle says sharing a human life, he's pretty, pretty blunt, isn't like feeding in the same pasture as cattle do. I think I mentioned that in my opening remarks. It requires sharing in logos, uh, reason, discourse, and thought. So how do we find spaces in which to argue productively when our views about politics, gender, education in schools or campuses, uh, life, religion, um, things that matter uh, might vary so radically. I mean, this, this grips the whole, the whole globe. Um, a world of a world of division as opposed to a polarized division as opposed to a world of fellowship. How do we find common ground? It's critical because common ground, I think, is what will keep us out of devastating wars. So it's not just local, it's really global, but it starts. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's one of these things, right? It's us trying to figure out how we have what can be a challenging conversation or, and how can we, how do we keep this up? Right. And I think, you know, well, I'm, we're, we want you to talk about what some of those ideas are. We're going to put you into breakout rooms so that you can have this conversation. And when we bring you back out, we'll talk about this among ourselves. So again, we're going to have, uh, five or six people, I think is the way these work inside the breakout rooms. I've shuffled you, uh, should be different folks. Um, all I need from you, I guess, is as we did before. How about giving us a, a thumbs up that says, hey, I'm okay with what's about to happen to me. Look at that. I like the enthusiastic. Linda, you did that. Perfect. Thank you for that. All right. I will see you back here in 12 plus one minutes. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Okay, first off, let's do this. What well, I can see, everybody, yeah, a big, big view. Um, you could see, you could hear, you had conversations. Give me a thumbs up or a neck. Oh, Larry says it was a little too short. I'm always a little worried about that timing thing. I like it though. Here's the deal: if people came back, if I had too many people saying it's too long, well, that's not the right number, right? I got. I like it when you're having good conversations and then you don't want to get away from it. All right, so we're, we're looking for hands like we did. And I say Ricky's got his hand up. I'm going to add uh, Ricky up here. All right, talk to us. I'm going to ask you to unmute. There we go. All right, talk to us. Tell us about what happened inside there. I think I think that firstly, I've I've listened to a lot of very interesting people, and uh, perhaps to combine the two groups. Firstly, I, I think it would be very helpful for people to to read around the the thoughts of people who are deep thinkers around this area or about the internet. And one of the best books I've seen is by a chap called Yanis Varoufakis. He is the um, he's the Greek chap who uh, tried to talk the EU out of uh, imposing neoliberalism on Greece. And it's called techno feudalism, which is quite interesting. Uh, the, the second thing is, I think it's very important to define our terms. Um, we use friendship in a very general way. Certainly in this conversation, it's been used in a, uh, a very broad sense. I think to me, a friend is somebody who I would act against my own best interests in order to help. Right, so so we have a bunch of guys up here in our little street. We're only five houses. We're a bunch of aging hippies. Uh, we've known each other well for a long time, and we feel that way about each other. And there's maybe one or other two people, one or two other people on the planet, uh, who I feel that way about. Yeah. So so I use the word meaningful. Um, meaningful relation or meaningful associate or something like that. But friends is, and the last thing I really want to say is that I, I don't like this internet thing. <laughs> story, you and me both. <laughs> I, 
Cool. That's cool. Yay. Okay. So, so I don't, and, and the reason I don't like it is it destroys community. Okay. I'm a communitarian. It almost uh, seems purpose built to destroy community, doesn't it? I mean, I don't mean the internet in general, but I mean these ad based websites that are kind of like dragging us in. I think that really is in some way it is. It, and, you know, it's the, I know it was I said it as sort of a joke earlier, but I think it's right at some level, which is it's trying to start a fight so that it'll keep you what Nancy said, engaged. Engagement is what they want. They don't want you to have a conversation, really. They don't want you to actually talk to each other and productively move the ball forward because that doesn't sell Buicks, right? They're, they want you to fight because this is what, and I think it's a terrible thing. So, so they don't want you to be a child. They don't want you to be uh, inquisitive. And they okay. don't want you to act. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've lived in New Zealand. It's a very small place. You can phone up the Minister of whatever and you can speak to them and you can email them and so on. And you can make a difference. Isn't that oh. something? Yeah, that's really something. Oh, you know that oh. oh Ricky, that it's so remarkable. I just have to add that um, you know, Aristotle uses friendship. He says it means many things from wide. For his, in his case, it's the whole polis, the city state, which isn't right. isn't isn't as wide as the globe or the cosmos, to just a few people um, that are your soulmates. And mm. we, I'm with you. Friend for us tends to move to the narrow, uh, for good reason, because that's what nourishes our souls most. And your comment about you would go against your self interest, your best interest, or your self interest in order to help a friend. He says if Friends require goodwill toward each other and affection or, or love, uh, and it's mutual. You you do not fail to recognize it, is how the Greek goes, and they do not fail to recognize it. And that goodwill sometimes can be sacrifice. I mean, think of people that sacrifice their lives for their friends. So you're right about that. It's hard to yeah. hard hard to achieve, but you're right. So here's Aristotle, a tricky passage, but it is brilliant. Friends sacrifice external goods, you know, like some mon money, even maybe a kidney, health, for the sake of the fine. That word fine, my daughter's named after that, kala, kalan, fine, beautiful, noble. It's right. not, you know, it, it that is, I think, gets to Ricky's point, the sacrifice is of things you can sacrifice in the name of the better good, the finer good, mm -hmm. the higher good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, back to that one piece about community. And I know I said, you know, I've said a couple of things here, and I think you and I've had this conversation before, but one of the reasons that I am doing this conversations event the way we do is because it essentially brings us face to face in conversation and it allows us to talk and to communicate in ways that like Facebook and Twitter and whatnot, all of these other things aren't really able to do, right? I mean, so basically, I think this is leading us to a productive conversation. We are meeting people, we're coming across new ideas. You know, we're getting a little bit challenged in some ways, but the thing is, I think this is a much more civil discourse than I can have on any chat group kind of thing. And also I'm been in many classrooms of 18 to 22 year olds. <laughs> Is that right? I mean, I, I mean, well, it depends, you know, but many of them are taking courses for credit and, you know, right. overloaded. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so we're we're at the or three minutes. So my thing is always, I say I'm going to start this time on time. I'm going to end this on time. We always use the end of this to thank our speaker. And you say, what does that mean? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everyone in the audience the amazing and powerful capability of unmuting themselves. Stop. And we are all going to thank Nancy <laughs> together. And I'm going to time you down and uh, we're going to do it together. Ready? So three, two. One go. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you in turn. Uh, it really was stimulating, energizing. Mm.